Hi, everybody. I'm Francesc Empoy, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about DGraph uh, and, in general, graph databases and a couple of things that, we've, that I built as a demo, which is basically trying to explore the world of Pokemon with uh, graph databases. So, yeah, that is the title of the talk. So, uh, about me, I lead product at DGraph, and uh, I joined three months ago, four months ago, something like that. Uh, and I'm on Twitter on GitHub. And before that, I've done a couple of things that you might have heard about. So just for funk is one of the things. And someone had a question about that. I'll answer that later. And also the Google Club platform podcast, that's something I created. And apparently people still listen to it. So that's cool. So the agenda uh, is going to be, we're going to start talking a little bit about graphs and databases and graph on databases and graph databases, the three things. And then we'll talk about DGraph specifically, how it works, what is the architecture, uh, which is actually quite interesting. And then the DGraph query language, which is called GraphQL plus minus. And then we do a live demo. And for the live demo, I'll have to move things around, but we'll get there eventually. Um, also have Q&A at the end, but if there's anything that seems weird or you have questions, just raise your hand and ask. That's totally fine. We're hiring. So yeah. <laughs> We are hiring. So uh, we are hiring here in Bangalore. We are hiring in San Francisco. And we're also hiring for senior people all around the world. So if you're interested, let us know. dgraph.io slash career, just in case you're not seeing it. Cool. So let's talk about graphs. Uh, how many of you have used graphs before? OK, cool. Most of you. Uh, and for those that have not raised your hands, probably you have also used graphs even if you don't know about them. Uh, so this is an example of a graph. This is actually a data set that we use for many examples for, this is actually the data, the data set that you're gonna see if you go to our playground. And it is basically uh, 21 million nodes talking about movies and directors and things like that. So here what we have is we have nodes and relationships. So when you say Steven Spielberg, that's a node, that's an entity, right? Jaws is also an entity. And the fact that Steven Spielberg directed Jaws, that's a fact. And it's represented with a relationship. That relationship is directed, right? Someone directed a movie. That is a, a that, and that's it. That's everything you have on a graph, okay? Basically. Now, the thing is that that was a little bit of a lie because when you have a node, you don't identify it by its name, right? Because uh, guess what? Multiple people could have the same name in the world, right? And that doesn't make them the same person. So uh, actually, we're going to have is we're going to have some other thing that identifies the node, and the name is an attribute or a property of that node, right? So for instance, name Steven Spielberg. Is this a touch screen? Wow, <laughs> that's cool. Uh, so <laughs> the uh, the node Steven Spielberg has name Steven Spielberg. That's the only property that we gave it to. But uh, the this node here, the movie Jaws has a name and also the year on which it was recorded, which is 1975. And then we also have a bunch of different things. Uh, and this is kind of like a tree, but it's not necessarily a tree because basic, a tree does not have cycles. A graph can have cycles, right? So it's more, gener more general. You can represent anything as a graph. OK, so let's talk about graphs in databases. So if you have this, right? and I tell you to store it in your favorite database, how would you do it? And uh, when you start thinking about this, right, what is your favorite database? DGraph, of course. But if it's not DGraph, right, maybe it's relational database or maybe it's NoSQL. That's basically the two main ones. And then you have all the things like key value store and you have graph databases. So think about relational database. When you think about relational database, probably you're gonna have a table director, a table movie, a table genre, right? Probably that's what you would do. And then for the relations, there's no concept. Relational databases do not have concepts to hold relations, which is kind of weird. They're really bad at doing relations, even though they're called relational. They do tables. That's the only thing they do, right? So if you want to map things, then you start to need to think about, oh, how do you map? If it's a relationship one-to-one, -one, you're going to have uh, you have foreign keys, right? Now, if it's one too many, on one side, you can say, I have a relationship, right? So on one side, you could say, Jaws 
was directed by Steven Spielberg. So Jaws will have foreign key pointing to Steven Spielberg. But if you do it the other way around and you want to have uh, the relationship from Steven Spielberg to movies, you cannot really do that. Maybe you have an array or something, but otherwise it's not really a thing, right? And if you have many to many, then you're out of luck. You need to create a new table, right? So let's see how this would be. This would do, right? You could say, oh, I'm gonna re I'm gonna model these as two tables: movie and director. And the movie has a director, so it has this field, which is the foreign key. Great. Now, if you want to get all of the movies directed by a director, what you need to do is actually you need to index by this key here. Otherwise, it would be really expensive. You will have to fetch the whole table and then figure out which ones actually have the ID that corresponds to Steven Spielberg, right? So those unions start to be quite expensive quite quick. Luckily, you have indexes, so that kind of solves the problem, but still, you need to defend those. And then I tell you that actually movies do not have one director, right? This movie has four directors. So now your database is broken and you need to fix it. And that's not a thing that it's easy to do, right? Moving from this to this, that is actually an expensive thing that you're going to need to plan over months if you have a big data set, right? You don't want to lose any of that data. So now what you're doing is you have this new table, movie director, that points to a movie and a director. Cool. What is a movie director? It is not a thing. We had to create it just because the database didn't agree with us, right? So that is extra complexity that you're adding to the model just because the technology doesn't fit what you need, right? What about non relational databases? You know, relational databases, Postgres, and everything, they're cool, they're really fast, but they're not powerful enough, they're not expressive enough. So we're gonna use non relational. Uh, does that solve the problem? Well, you could do something like this. So how, how many of you have used MongoDB? OK, so MongoDB, basically, this is what you would do. You have different kinds of documents. You have a director document. And probably you have a few movies that has all of, the, all of the IDs of the movies that they directed. And that's pretty good. And then here you have the name, the year, and all that stuff. Now, how would you do if I told you I want to get the names of all the movies directed by Steven Spielberg? You fetch this, you get that list, and then you fetch this, you fetch this, you fetch this, right? So there's, if n is the number of movies, you need to do n plus one calls. That doesn't scale, right? It, it is a little bit of a problem. So, you know, this is not good enough. No worries, we fix it. We put it everything in one single document. Easy, now it's one call. That scales much better, but, what do you do if you want to get something slightly different or a movie has more than one director? You cannot do that, right? If a movie has more than one director, as we saw it could happen, this doesn't work. So you're out of luck. Okay, well, let's assume that we have this. We re repeat the information. So now if a movie has more than one director, then you would go here go here and then maybe find the directors and go back and find the other directors. This starts to get more complicated. And the worst part is that now you're repeating information. So now if I say, oh, I'm going to update the information about the movie, you know, uh, Jurassic Park, uh, apparently something in it is wrong and I fix it and I fix it here, but I forgot to fix it here. Now you lost the consistency of your database, and at that point, why do you have a database, right? Like the whole point of a database is to help you be consistent. So all of this is, you know, these are things that there's techniques. There are techniques to fix these issues, but still, you need to apply those techniques. You need to think about that. So that's why we have graph databases, right? And in a graph database, what you do is basically, you remember that model that we had with the, the movies, the directors, and all that stuff? That's it. That's what you store, right? So instead of thinking about the different tables or the different documents and stuff, what you have is you have notes and you have relationships. And that's it. So let's think about, let's see about how you do that. How do you do data graph modeling? How do you model your, uh, data, how do you model your data to fit in a database, in a graph database? So you have two different things. 
uh, according to what we saw in the previous model. Then we'll see that actually these two things are the same. You have uh, things like name jaws or year 1975, and that's what we call uh, subject predicate value. Subject is the movie Jaws, predicate is name, and value is Jaws itself, or Jaws was filmed in 1975. So those are predicates with values, and we call them with values because they point to not a node, but a string, an integer, or whatever it is. And then you have subject, predicate, object. So for instance, when you say uh, the movie Jaws was directed by Steven Spielberg, that is two different nodes related by a predicate. And that is what we call subject, predicate, object, and it's basically the same, to the point that actually the graph stores it exactly the same way. There's no difference. So uh, once we see this, actually, again, here I'm lying, because the name JAWS, we don't store JAWS was directed by Steven Spielberg. What we store is there's an ID, uh, 0x1, we're calling it, that has the name JAWS. That same ID was recorded in 1975. That same ID was directed by 0x2. That's a different ID. And that is the ID that corresponds to Steven Spielberg. So that Steven Spielberg is 0x2, that has name Steven Spielberg, right? So actually there's no strings, there's no integers, like it is just IDs related to stuff. And that stuff could be the name, a year, or it could be all the nodes, okay? Cool, so that is how you store the, the data. So given this, a little bit of notation, because this is how we talk about it in uh, DGraph. So all of these numbers, 0x1, 0x2, and all that stuff, we call them UIDs, universal identifiers. Has name, was recorded, and all that stuff. Those are predicates. Uh, some people call it edges or relationships, same thing. We call them predicates. And then Jaws, Steven Spielberg, or 1975, those are values. Uh, so strings, integers, and all of those things. Those are just called them values. Yeah, every entity has its own UID. Yeah. Yes. Previous one. So here, this every node, every circle has its own UID, right? And then attached to that UID, in this case, you're going to have two different predicates, name and year. Those are predicates. No, that, that is a node. And this node, actually, we don't store anything in the node. The node, the only thing that we know about the node is there's a UID. It has an identifier. And everything we attach, we attach to it are like either those properties are predicates that point to a string or an integer, or they're predicates that point to something else being another UID. Yeah. Sorry? Do the nodes become the identifiers? The nodes disappear. There's no nodes. There's only UIDs, predicates, and values. Oh, yeah, actually. For later. Uh, cool. Any other questions about how we model the data? Cool. Okay, so did we see this already? No. Okay, so uh, the way we actually store the data is by having the UID and the predicate together, and that's a key, and we store in a key value store, okay? That key value store is something we call Badger, by the way, which is also open source, super cool, and you should give it a try. Uh, so when we say this movie is called Jaws, what we have is somewhere we store the key 0x1 has name. 0x1 is the UID, has name is the predicate, and then the value is Jaws, right? So then 0x2 has name uh, points to Steven Spielberg. Then we also have was recorded in the year 1975, was directed by 0x2. But the idea is that you have UIDs and predicates become a key, and then you have the value. So then this just becomes something that you need to store and uh, access every single time you want to access the value. You just find that key and find whatever we stored, right? So that, that is everything we store, almost. Hmm? 
we'll get there. So the question was, how do you traverse the data, the database? And that is the next slide. So we'll get there in a minute. Um, but yeah, this is how we store the data. So now, how do we? Yes. How do you uh, model site? So for instance, if you had something like a cycle that was uh, friends, right? Like, so I, I know you, you know him, and he knows me. Uh, that is, uh, there is my, and I have UID one, two, and three. There will be one saying one knows two, two knows three, three knows one. That, that there's three different key uh, UID predicate pairs the, the, that are keys. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm going to try. Throw something at me if I don't. <laughs> okay, cool. So life, uh, let's see the life of a query, right? Like if I send a query, what happens in the database? So uh, the first thing is you're going to start, you're going to find in, from what node you're going to start, right? So let's assume that we know the UID. So it's UID 1. It's me. That's it, right? That's where we start. That could also be a set, so we could start from multiple nodes at the same time and then do all the paths from there. But let's imagine there's only one. Then I'm going to say, OK, so who do I know? OK, so I'm going to get my ID plus the predicate knows and put those together. And that's a key. And I'm going to look for that key in the key value store. And then I'm going to get a value, which is all of the people that I know. And then, yeah, so that's the UID predicate pair. I'm going to look for that. I'm going to get a value. And then the next step is going to be, are you done? Or what else do you want to know? Let's say that I actually want to know all of the names of the people that I know. So once I get the list of the UIDs of the people that I know, from that list, you're going to append for every UID the predicate name and get that value. right? So and that's pretty much it. So if you want to go farther, farther on, you just keep on repeating those steps over and over until you find what was requested. And the good thing is that until you get to the end, right? Until the point where you say name, which is a string, before we only work with UIDs, and those are integers, right? So if I say, actually, I don't want to know the name of my other people I know. I want to know the names of the people that know the people that I know the people that I know, right? It's just a bunch of integers that we need to do operations on and unions and intersections and whatever, but those are integers. So it's actually very efficient compared to if you said we were using the names of the strings themselves, right? So let's say, yeah, uh, let's get the names of the friends of 0x1234. This would look something like this. 0x1234 is friends with someone. And then we're going to get the has name, whatever name, right? That is the idea of the query. This is not the query language you use, right? This is just an example, so we get it. So we're going to start by finding the node with UID 0x1234. Then we append is friends with to 0x1234, and we get the value. And then let's say that that gives me 0x ABCD, 0x BCDE, right? So those two are two more UIDs. What I'm going to do is I'm going to append 0x ABCD to has name and then get a value, Diggy, which is the name of the mascot, by the way. And 0x BCD has name, OG. Does anyone know what mascot is OG? Yes. It's a open source project created by Rob Pike. It's like a weird bird. Uh, not important. But uh, so we get that, and then that's it. Now we, we got the 0x ABCD has name. We got the value Digi and the value OG, and that's the result. Okay, so that is the whole process. Any questions about this part? Use the mic. If it doesn't work, just I'll repeat the question. Just, no, just, Hello. oh, yeah. Nice. OK, um, so how do we add the predicates to the UIs? What is the operation? Concatenation, literally. It's just that you put them together. Just concatenate. Yeah, with a separator and everything, so you can figure out what is the UID and what is the predicate, but that's it. It's just like literally just put them both together, and that's the key that you're going to look for in the, in the uh, key value store. Key value, yeah. yeah. But uh, how do we know which predicate to add? Because one UID, as you mentioned, might, might have multiple predicates. 
Yes, we know the predicate by its name. So the name is friends with, that is the predicate is friends with. So when I say, oh, find me the people that, 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 I, that I'm friends with, that's what I'm looking for. I'm just looking for that string attached to, so starting 0, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, followed by is friends with. If we find that, it means that I'm friends with someone. If we do not find it, it means that I'm not friends with anyone. That's it. OK. Uh, yeah, that's the. Hello. Yeah. So in real life, uh, what if uh, the query is something like, give me all the names of the friends of uh, Rob. Yeah. So here we have to go back. Like I have to find. Yes, we'll get there in a second. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, earlier example, you have uh, names of a movie and names of a director. Yeah. So there are two contexts to that. So has name will return. So is there a uh, saving context because we can do has movie name or has, but in that case has name won't return anything. So we have to re uh, add two different set of thing or can we no. add some kind of context? Name is one predicate, no matter what node or type you're thinking about. So whether it's a movie or a director, they both have names. So we'll store it exactly the same way. There's no way to, well, there's some ways, but the way we store it, there's no difference in between uh, 0x1 name Steven Spielberg, 0x2 name Jaws. They look exactly the same. Yeah. In case we want to find all the movie names or like, uh, so in that case, like just having. We'll get there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we return DD and RG, which were the strings that we're looking for. Okay, so. Uh, the question that uh, he was asking about is, sure, 0x, 1, 2, 3, 4, it's great, but what if I'm actually looking for the friends of Rob, right? Who's Rob? We first need to find them, that person. So the way that works is actually, uh, so we name Aji or whatever. There's a lot of different ways of finding what are the, those first nodes that we're going to be working with, right? We don't always know the UIDs. It's not a fair thing to expect people to know the UIDs of the database. We need to be able to find them somehow. And for that, what we do is we use indices. So we can build indexes in a bunch of different things. So for instance, we have indexes on strings. So in this case, we could search for exactly the same name, right? Exactly Rob. So it needs to be called Rob, otherwise we'll not find it. Up to, you know, even exactly the same casing, capital R, otherwise it doesn't work. That's exact. Um, if you want to store something smaller, you can also store the hash. And it allows you to do the same things, except for when you have exact, you can actually sort the strings because you have the previous value. But if you have the hash, you lost that. So you cannot even sort them. You cannot say something that, you know, it's bigger than A, smaller than B. That you need exact. Hash will not be enough. Then we also have term. So if, say, Frances Campoy, that's my name. So uh, we're separating into two parts. They, you could be able to find me by Frances or Campoy. And it would actually lowercase it so it's easier to find. Full text is uh, basically like Elasticsearch. So it does smart things like if you say running, it will actually get the root for that word. So it will say run instead of running. So you, you can search then ran, and ran is the past of run, so we still find it, right? So a little bit more sm smarter, smarter uh, index creating for natural languages. Uh, then we have trigram that allows you to do regular expressions. So you can search by prefix or whatever you're looking for. Uh, then we have data in by year, month, date, hour. Um, in float and bool have just their index. There's nothing fancy there. And then geo properties uh, will allow you to find things by the location. So we also, we also support that. So uh, in order to create an index, you need to first say that this, uh, that you create an index on a, on a predicate, right? So I'm going to create an index on name. Or I'm going to create an index on year of recording, right? Uh, but before you can do that, you actually need to declare those predicates. The thing is that you don't really need to declare anything on dgraph initially. You can just put data there. And then later on, start modifying the schema, right? So uh, here, for instance, you would say name, the type string, and then add index and all of the kind of indexes that you want to have. 
So if I want to have index on the, on the recording year, I will have recording year uh, int, but let's say it's an int, at index int dot, that's it. That's how you write it. And we'll see this in a minute, actually, like in real, uh, real live demo. So let's update that, the life of a query, rather than using the UIDs, also you could use an index, right? So instead of saying, find me all of the friends, find me all of the names, all of the friends of 0x1, you could say, find the names of all of the friends of someone named Rob, okay? So you can also do that thanks to indexes. Cool, any questions up to here? Oh, we have a... <laughs> yes. Yeah, Yeah. we have a few questions here. Instead of considering it, does it actually use a document-like thing where you have a key of 0x1234 and value of whatever predi predicate name instead of having a separator between them? Uh, so we do not store a document. We do not store like a JSON document. We actually just store, so if you have a person has name, age, and location, that will be three different predicates. And they're, set, they're stored separately. So if then you want to fetch all of those things, you need to say, I want to fetch the three things. But also you could fetch only one. So basically it makes it so, you know, uh, ha has anyone used GraphQL? Okay, so the whole point of GraphQL is the fact that you say exactly what you want, right? So instead of having to do it by filtering a big JSON document and removing the things we don't want, actually we do it the, the, way, the other way around. We build that data that you're asking for uh, as we are, part, we are uh, traversing the graph. And the second question, how do you define predicates? Is it is friends with predefined or is it defined as a part of schema? Or is there as a concept of schema? So it is part of the schema, but you do not need to define it initially. You, if, you send, if you send some data and I say 0x1 name Francesc, that will define if it didn't exist, it will add the predicate name of type string on the schema itself. So we'll, we'll see that in, in a live demo in a minute. Okay. How do you handle same predicator multiple times, like multiple movies director for a single movie? So uh, uh, what we store in the value, actually there was an example. Oh, it died. Okay. <laughs> uh, why did it die? Okay, so yeah, so here we have an example. Uh, 0x1234 is friends with two different things. So actually you can have multiple values. That value can be a list. And that's actually what we call a, post, a posting list. So basically, instead of having many times the same uh, uh, UID predicate, that will actually repeat very often with all of the values. We just have it once. And the value is the list of all of the things that we're related to. That's it. Thank you. Yes. So how do you find all the people who have more than five friends? Do you uh, have a on that? Yeah, so you can do that. I will do it in, in live demos. But yeah, uh, ask me the question once we're doing the live demo. I'm happy to show. Uh, I have a question as well. Uh, so how do you, so as you mentioned, right, it's a key value store that you use underlying. And then yeah. how do you power uh, search use cases or match and names? Because in key value stores, how like you would have to keep something else then. Sorry, say that again. So since it's a key value store, how yeah. do you power use cases of search? Because in key value, you can just do lookups based on IDs. indexes. So the index is basically going to use also the key value store. But for instance, for the index, uh, if I'm creating an index term on my name, Francesc Campoy Flores, that would actually create three different keys, Francesc Campoy and Flores, and they would all point to my UID. So then there would be, uh, there could be X number of indexes that you could keep. Is there such limitations that you have? There's no limitation. You can create as many. I mean, there's limitations of how big your hard disk is. But, so, you know. so, so does it have memory impact or it's stored in disk? I'm not sure about that one, actually. The boss. <laughs> uh, it's all stored in disk on Badger. And Badger itself is optimized so that um, it will use like not that much memory. Yeah. Thank you. Cool, okay, so let's continue. 
Uh, yeah, that's enough. Okay, so now we're gonna be talking, now that we know how we store the data, how do we actually you know, make the thing run? Uh, we, we don't have just one single server, we have actually many. Uh, the whole point being that if you have only one server and that server crashes, you don't have a database anymore. But if you have many servers and one of them crashes, you just have a database that is a little bit not as fast or not as powerful as before, but you have the time to restart the, other, the, the server that crashed and keep on serving traffic, right? That redundancy basically gives you a robustness. So we have three kinds of uh, nodes, and actually there's only two in the database. We have this one extra that we call Rattle or Ratel or Rattel, depending on where you're from, apparently. Uh, so I call it Rattle. Uh, and this is a web UI. So this is a playground where you can write your code, like write your queries and see the result and all that stuff. And I'm gonna be using that uh, for the live demo. And then we have alphas and zeros. And you can have many alphas and you can have many zeros, right? Uh, so in a very, very high level point of view, alphas store data and zeros manage the database itself at a very high level of abstraction. That's pretty much what they do. So uh, zeros, are called zeros because they actually use, so everything here, since you, have, you can have multiple uh, servers performing the same tasks for, like, for anything like cluster management, you could only have one if you wanted to, but you can, only, you can also have three, which helps with the fact that if you lose one, it still works. But if you have three, which one is the one that is right, right? So that's a little bit of a problem, and we use Raft, a consensus algorithm, to decide on that. So uh, when we talk about groups, we're talking about raft consensus groups. So zero is the raft consensus group zero that manages all of the information about uh, the cluster itself. So for all of the servers, what are their roles? Uh, how do we talk to one or the other and all that stuff? Uh, that's where this is gonna be stored in the zeros. Uh, you need to have at least one and you can have, normally you can have three or five that's normally it's gonna be three, that's more than enough, because if one dies, you still have two, they're gonna be able to keep working while the, the one that died restarts. And uh, then we have alphas, and alphas, I don't know what they're called alphas, because if the other one has zeros, they should be ones, but they're called alphas. Uh, and these serve the groups one and on, okay? And these are actually storing the data. So what we do is, uh, we, we could have only one extra group, the, the group one and store all of our data in there, right? So then all of the nodes in that group, they're gonna be storing the same data. They're replicating the whole data set. But if one dies, you know, you're still keeping the data. And also the more of the nodes you have, the faster you can answer the request, the more load you can handle, okay? But what happens if all of the data you have doesn't fit in a single machine? What you're gonna do is you're gonna have multiple replica groups. So that's why we have group one or two or three. Most of the time you're gonna see only one group because actually you can store a lot of data in there, but if you need it more, that's how you would shard the things. And the way we shard the data is by predicate. So let's say we have only two predicates, name and age, and they're all so big that they do not fit in a single machine. Probably you would have group one serving all of the data for the predicate name, group two serving all the data for the predicate age, okay? Cool. We're hiring. <laughs> okay, and then Rattle, which is the web UI. And uh, it is very useful for, for data exploration to the point that I've heard uh, some of our customers saying that they dump uh, JSON data into this and then they explore it, right? You don't need to do anything else. You just dump JSON data and now you see it as a graph, you can navigate it, it's pretty cool. So yeah, Rattle, alphas and zeros. Rattle or any client is going to send the queries to alphas and alphas are gonna talk to other alphas if they do not have the data that they need to, to, uh, to answer the, the response. And also they're gonna be talking to zeros to figure out what they're supposed to do. Okay, and zeros also talk to each other and manage the cluster. Cool, any questions about this part? Yeah. Yeah, uh, all this alphas and zeros would be residing in one machine or multiple machines? Each, you could run it, all of this in a single machine, but then if that machine crashes, you lost the database. 
which is sad. Uh, so normally what you're going to do is each one of these will be running a different machine, but also you could have all of these in only three machines and then have Kubernetes and let Kubernetes decide what runs where. So that's, that's up to you. In, in uh, my demo, I'm going to be running everything in a single machine, which is not a great idea, but for demos, it's good enough. I cannot hear you, sorry. If, oh, it's fine. Yeah, so my, like data is, uh, my data is distributed in multiple alpha. So my rattle will talk to one alpha or it talks to multiple alpha? Talks to any of the alpha, any alpha. You can no. talk to any of the, just no, one. any alpha, but yeah. it always talks to one alpha, right? That's up to you. You can choose which one you talk to. Any of the alphas will answer any of the queries. No, but they will be that, able to, if they don't have, if, if this if one. they don't have the data. So if this one doesn't have the data, this one will send a query to the one that has the data and then will send you the data. So it will act as a proxy. So okay. you don't need to think about what you should talk to. You should talk to any alpha and they will have the data. Uh, uh, hey, this is Karan. I work at Gojek. We are potentially looking at using dgraph cool. internally. So how well uh, does dgraph handle latency between nodes? Like, could I potentially put nodes in different regions? Yeah, you, you can. Uh, the only thing is, depending on how you're going to be running it, like eventually you could have transactions being a little bit slower because in order to achieve a transaction, I'm not going to get into the details of that because like complicated, but uh, if the nodes that need to decide on anything, they need to talk to each other and they're really far, the latency can add a little bit, but in general, you can actually do that totally fine. Yeah. Because very often when you're going to be talking to an alpha, you can actually have replicas for the alpha storing the data in your own region. So that will be quite fast. Transactions require uh, talking to more machines. So that can be a little bit more complicated, but we can talk more in detail. Actually, it's yeah, probably I'll good. take the rest of the questions. Okay. Yeah. We can talk about that in the Q&A actually. Okay. Yes. Last question. So uh, one thing before you can, keep the questions relevant to what I just explained. For general questions, we'll have a Q&A section at the end. So who handles a uh, locking mechanism? Is it alpha or zero? Who handles? A uh, locking mechanism for transactions. Transactions. We'll talk about that at the end. Okay. Yeah, because that's yesterday. Was it yesterday or two days ago? We spent like three hours talking about that. So yeah. <laughs> Any other questions about this part? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, zero looks like me. Uh, it behaves like a service discovery, like console. Because it has a uh, raft consensus protocol and yeah. you have quorum. So why you need, like do why you didn't adapt whatever is whatever is there in the market like console as a because that computer. would mean that then you need to run also a console. Okay, this Instead is part of, of part of your product itself or you are running as a service. This is the yeah. graph. Okay. This part here. This is something that we run on top, this is optional, but this is the database. Okay, and uh, who decide how many replica of data I have to store and uh, where? You decide it. You can, you can start with saying, uh, I'm going to have one replica per group, and that's always so fine. So that is can... part of DGRAPH configuration? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I didn't get a chance to ask question on the starting slide. Yep. So suppose if I compare with Neo4j, so there we create a node, we give a node name, basically a table name, suppose. And then we define a schema that this table name, suppose movie, it will have a movie name, then uh, which year and all. Then yes. you have a director node which has some attributes. Then you add constraint on that node, like duplicate entries will not be there. You should not allow those. We can talk about that at the end. We're going to have Q&As. That's uh, again, Neo4j things. We're going to talk at the end. Happy to do so. Uh, we do not have constraints on, on this. Uh, right. That's right. Yeah. We, we just store predicates and at the, at the end of this slide, I'm actually going to be talking about types, which is somehow similar to the node type, known names, but it's a little bit different. We'll talk about that. Okay, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, one more. <laughs> so uh, the question was, if, if I send these, uh, I'm asking about the data about age, right? And this one only stores name. Uh, age is stored by this one, how does this one know where to ask? Zeros will tell them. Zeros know who handles what, 
and they let alphas know all of the time. It's like, this is, this is what the cluster looks like, right? So when the alpha needs to talk to someone, already knows who to talk to without talking to the zero. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just to cut it, like, I mean, people can ask, actually ask the questions at the end uh, rather than cutting the flow. And also, unless it is really pressing, like keep it at the end and then you can discuss for more time. And also during the break time, both of them will be available. So yeah, we discuss have discuss more. Uh, then short answers. Yeah, for, for like, if, if there are relevant questions to what it's on the slide, go for it. If not, we can keep it to the end. Cool, so conclusion, conclusion, it's not necessary. We already just saw this. So let's talk about GraphQL plus minors, which is the query language that we use. So uh, it's inspired by GraphQL. So if you've ever used GraphQL, it will look quite similar, but it's not exactly the same because GraphQL is not expressive enough to express the things we need to for graph for databases, right? So it has a little bit extra things, but also there's some things of GraphQL that do not make sense for a database. So it also has things that are missing. And that's why, that's why it's called plus minus, because it has some extra things and some missing things. Uh, GraphQL support is actually coming up soon. Uh, already, I can show a demo later if you're interested. It's already kind of working. Uh, and also, if you want to try it out, uh, you can go to play.digraph.io. That is an instance of Rattle that runs on the cloud. That way you can try it out. It doesn't allow you to mutate the data because that'd be dangerous. So it's, only, it's read only. But uh, otherwise, it's a very nice way to get started. So how do you store data? So you store data uh, with mutations. So a mutation looks like this. And here what I'm saying is I'm going to store uh, something attached to a UID. This is not a UID, this is what we call a blank UID. And basically, this is a holder for UID, right? I'm saying something that I'm calling for now Alice, but you know, that is not a UID, UIDs are numbers, uh, has a predicate name and it's attached to Alice, the string Alice, okay? And then a dot because these are end quads and that's how the format works. So you need to put that dot at the end and I always forget, but you need to put it, otherwise, that's a parse. Okay, so here, if you do that, you're storing the data for Alice. Cool. Then you're gonna get a response, and one of the things you're gonna get is this here, that's basically telling you, oh, the node that you called Alice, that UID that you said Alice, it's actually now 0x1, that it's, a, it's real UID, okay? So now next time, if you wanna ask for Alice, what you can do is say node 0x1. Why do we have those? Uh, blank holders, right? Like those blank UIDs, because that way you can repeat the same one and all of those things will attach to the same UID. So here I'm saying, whatever UID that I still don't know about, I'm gonna name it Bob, has the name Bob, and the same UID knows the uh, whatever UID is 0x1, okay? So now we have run that, now created Bob 0x2. Okay, so that's why we have blank UIDs. So you can create multiple, you can attach multiple predicates to one single uh, UID at the same time. So with that, we created this. We create 0x1, 0x2. We said 0x1 has named Alice, 0x2 has named Bob, and 0x1 knows, 0, 0x2 knows 0x1. That's the graph that we created with those two mutations. So let me do this as a live demo if I'm able to, because we brought the table here for that. Oh yeah, so uh, I'm gonna run the database. So in order to run the database, there's many ways, but uh, I can dgraphql zero, that will start one zero, dgraphql alpha, that will start one alpha. So actually I think I messed that up. No, okay, working. And then I'm gonna use rattle connected to local host, and I'm gonna send those mutations. So I'm gonna say, said, uh, I'm gonna say Alice, let me make it a little bit bigger, name Alice, Bob, ooh, Chinese, no, uh, uh, Bob, name Bob, that is a Chinese dot two, that's not gonna work, and uh, Bob knows Alice. So this is creating the same uh, graph as before, okay? So let's run that. That worked and it created Alice and Bob. So now if you go to the schema, 
you will see that this has been created directly, right? I didn't say anything. This, this, I just started this database, it was completely empty. So now we know that there's predicate name of type default uh, because we don't know, know what type it is. It says string, but actually you could put anything else in there. So it just says default. And then knows is of a list of UIDs because you can know many people. Cool. So actually this is probably not what we want. So let's say, oh no, this is actually a string. And now, okay, cool. So we can do queries like this. Uh, we can say, oh, with the UAD 0x1 and 0x2, give me the names attached to it. So let's do that. The query, UAD 0x1, 0x2, uh, UID and name around this, and it gives me the data in a JSON format, right? So uh, this is basically almost GraphQL, and this is uh, the result. Cool. So you can also do knows, UID, and name. So now what I'm doing is, okay, so uh, get the UID and name for each one of these people, and also go find all of the people that they know, and also give me their UID and their name, okay? Uh, uh, mm, no, <laughs> it doesn't. Okay, that's the biggest I can do. Um, cool, so if I run this, oh, actually I run it already. So you can see 0x1, Bob, Nose, 0x2, Alice, right? So now we're able to fetch that data and going a little bit deeper. The cool thing is you can also get the graph. And you see Alice and Bob and how they know each other. So they're connected. There's a, yeah, you can actually set an arrow, right? So this is the basics of how you store data and how you fetch it. Now, the next thing is going to be, you know, uh, I want to actually get only the information for Bob, but I do not know what is the UID for Bob, right? So I'm going to use an index. So I can do a filter by equal name Bob. Okay, that's how you say, find all of the nodes that have name Bob. And if I run this, it will say, nope, you cannot do that because the attribute, attribute name is not indexed. So let's add an index. You go here, say index, and you can choose a bunch of different ones. Since I'm actually looking uh, exactly by the name, you can just go with exact. And then I need to go smaller and click update and then go bigger again. <laughs> Cool, so now if we run this, not that. <laughs> now we have the same information, right? But now we didn't know that Bob had the UID 0x1. We actually found it through the index. Let me show the query again. Cool. So that's already all of the slides. <laughs> You can create as many indexes as you want on as many fields as you want. But the data type changes? Uh, on the you need to first say what type it is. So if it's just, you need, default, cannot, you cannot create indexes on default, but you can create, if you want, if you know this is a string, you can say, oh, this is a string, create index on string, and then you can choose which time you want. The more, you the more indexes you create, the more data you're gonna have to store. So the idea is create only the indexes that you need. Yeah. No, but, but if I create multiple index, then it will be like search will be faster, right? The stuff will be faster, but then stuff will be bigger. So eventually it doesn't fit, right? So there's a trade off in between how many, like only use the indexes that you actually need okay. because you could create an index. So for instance, for the trigram for regular expressions, that's going to be quite big, right? That's going to store a decent amount of information. If you're not using it, why are you storing it? And also, it will be faster to fetch, but when you put in the information, you actually still need to update those indexes. So there's a trade-off, you need to be careful, and only create the indexes that you need. Wait, oh, here. Sorry. Yeah, you go. Uh, can you go back to the demo once? I just want to ask. So when you showed the first demo, you had that UID keyword in there uh, after funk, right? Yeah, UID is a function too. So you can, instead of equals, that is a function that allows me to find all of the nodes, all of the UIDs that have a predicate of type, of a predicate that has the value Bob. You can also use UID that will return all of the UIDs that you gave it to. 
So UID 0x1, that would be. So here, this 0x1, right? So this equal name buff would be exactly, it would return exactly the same thing as this. But here, you need to know the UID. In the other one, you're using indexes, so you don't need to. Okay, thank you. Cool. Uh, how do you deal with uh, deep traversals? So if you have no- We'll get there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, yes, so types. This is something that was added actually in the latest release, B1.1.0 that was released like yesterday, uh, like two or three days ago. Um, and uh, the idea is that the same way you can attach uh, predicates like name and nose and other things to any node, you can also attach a specific predicate that it's called digraph.type. And then basically what you're saying is this node is of type person, for instance. And then that's enough. If you want to, that's enough. Then from there, without defining anything else, you can start saying, give me all of the nodes of type person. And that will work. But also you can say, what are the fields instead of a person? And then extra things will unlock. Okay, so you can start from just saying this is a person. You can go a little bit deeper. So yes, so that's enough for now. Uh, this is how you define a type. This is a type person uh, that has a name string. It knows it's a list of UIDs. These actually, these should correspond to actual uh, predicates, right? So name is a predicate, nodes is a predicate. And then you can fetch them by saying, instead of equals or UID, you can say type person. And that will give you all of the UIDs of the nodes attached to the type person. And that's pretty much it for step zero. So let's actually do that in the live demo. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do, without doing anything else, right? Like I'm not defining anything yet. I'm gonna do 0x1 digraph.type person and 0x2. Actually, I think you need to do this so it parses. 0x2, thank you. Digraph type person. So now by doing this, I'm just saying, hey, these two nodes are of type person. Okay, that, that's it. I have not defined what person is yet. But even with just this, which is literally labeling, now I can go here and do, give me all of the names, let's just do the only name, uh, of type person. And now it's giving me Bob and Alice because those are, pe those are persons, okay? So this is like the basic, basic level. And this already is super useful. And this is actually what I used for most of the things that you're gonna see later in the live demo. Uh, but if you wanted to do more, there's a cool thing called expand. And expand, what it does is it will find what are the predicates associated to this node according to its type and just expand that, okay? So let's do that. I'm gonna expand, oh. And if you do this, you get nothing. Why? Because we have not said anything about the type person. We have not defined it yet. So let's create the type. So types at type person. And let's say it has both predicates and create type. Cool. So now person is a type that is not just a label. We actually know stuff about it. So when you run this query, you're gonna see Bob and Alice. Someone might wonder, why is nose not there? And the thing is that nose is not there because if you write, basically this is like writing this. Expand all basically becomes this. If you run this, you get nothing. Why? Because there's nothing inside of that. Nose points to something, but you're not asking for UID, not name or anything, so then it doesn't return anything. So you can do UID and I works, or let's do name. Or you could also do this, which is kind of cool. Expand all and then expand all inside. And that doesn't work because I did something weird. Repeated subgraph, oh yeah, because name is already there. So you cannot repeat fields multiple times. So since name is already there, it complains. Cool, so now it actually tells me that Bob 
knows Alice. Cool, and this is because we define types. But again, you do not need to define types, but they're helpful for specific things. Cool, and I think that's enough for types. Uh, I'm gonna show you this really quick. Uh, when on my live demo, the way I assigned types was, eh, you know, like this works, but you would not do this in production, right? Like getting UID by UID and writing them. So there's actually an interesting thing to do, which is, you know, find all of the, find all of the nodes that have the predicate name, for instance, and say that all of those are people, they're person, right? So that is what an absurd does. So an absurd, you would say an absurd, whoops, uh, query everything that has a name and put it in this variable people, and then set all of those UIDs to the graph type person. So this will get all of the nodes that have names and say those are now of type person. So then for the rest, you can keep on working with those. Okay, this is a little bit more advanced, but I thought it was kind of cool to show, so. Cool, and there's much more, and there's actually a pretty long live demo, but I don't know if I should be doing it now. Yeah, okay, cool. So on the demo now, we're gonna see a bunch of other things that you can do with the database, and also we're gonna see Pokemon. Yay. Uh, all of the code for this is uh, there on github.com slash campoy slash pokergraph. Uh, it's open source. The data that it uses is also open source. So you can, it's actually not open source because I forgot to put a license, but I put a license and then it'll be open source. Uh, so this is the data. Uh, it comes from Poke API, which is a REST API. So uh, instead of using the REST API, I just got the, the GitHub repository holding all the JSON files. And I use that because it's much faster, especially in India especially in a hotel in India. <laughs> so, uh, cool. Uh, so yeah, we're still hiring. Uh, so let's go with this. So I have this instance running Docker and it's running, you don't need to see much, but it's running an alpha, a zero and rattle. So it's running these three, uh, these three things in one single instance of Google Cloud Platform, okay? So I can connect to it by doing this one, yes. Okay, so now I'm gonna need actually, one second. My notebook. Uh, oh yeah, that's it. Cool, so this data has, there's a lot of things in, in, this, in this data set, actually includes all of the Pokemon in the world, the eggs, the type, the color, the gender, the uh, attacks, the, like all of the things that you can imagine of a Pokemon is in here, right? So there's a lot of data. Uh, we're gonna be playing with the basic things, but then you can run it yourselves. Uh, it's literally just one command, run the whole thing and play with the data set yourselves. So the first thing we're gonna do is find Pikachu because I like Pikachu. So we're gonna do it by doing uh, equals name Pikachu and give me the name and the UID. Uh, Pikachu lowercase, Pikachu, cool. And there's three Pikachus, um, why is this? Well, let's see a little bit more. What are the types? Okay, so there's actually three different ones. Let's see, let's render them. This one is Pokemon form, this one is Pokemon species, and this one is a Pokemon. Because guess what? Pikachu is of the species Pikachu on the form Pikachu. So that's why you see three types. They're different things, they all have the same name, right? So the same idea of here types actually help you identify a little bit because they all have a name and the names are all the same. So now uh, is the, one question. Yes. Is the type a slice? Yes, you can have as many types as you want. So at, for instance, you could create, uh, you know, Steven Spielberg, he's a person, yes, but he's also a director and he's also an actor and okay. he's probably also other things, right? So you can have many types of shared to one and use the type that you care about independent in the context, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Cool. So since they have types, we can go see, and actually this is kind of cool. Uh, let me see on the, this repository, if you go to type dev, this program, which is also written in Go, which is good because it's a Go, it's a Go meetup. Uh, this uses Digo, which is our Go client for DGraph. And what it does is it fetches, so fetches all of the predicates from the schema, fetches all of the types that I have designed, defined, and then what it does, it matches them together and it generates a schema for you. So you can run this on any database, on any DGraph instance, and it will work. Uh, when you generate, when you run it, it generates something like, uh, no, talk, uh, uh, types of schema. So it generates something like this with all of the different types and the, uh, and the predicate. So I use this program to generate the schema from scratch, and that way I'm able to do things like expand. So on the query, we can go now and say expand all. And that's pretty useless. Uh, so if you see the JSON result, it actually added a bunch of things, right? Uh, it added the way, the location, whatever the name that is default. So it added a lot of things, but there's no re extra relationships. Why? Well, because actually, if you want the relationship, not only you need to write the nose, but also somewhere, something inside. Otherwise, nothing works. So you can do expand all again. That's going to give you more information. And the graph, all of a sudden, starts to be more interesting. So now you can see that Pikachu lives in the forest. There is a quadruped that likes the ground. It's of, uh, let's see, it's of species Pikachu, which is of color blue, red, blue, for some reason. Oh, no, red, blue is the game. But all of these things, you see, like, you start generating all of these things quite easily. There is a cool way of doing this, too, which is recurse. So if you do def1, you're going to get the first one that we had. Def2 is expand all with an expand all inside. And I'm going to do three, but no more than that, because this starts to be quite big. And uh, yeah. <laughs> So let's expand all the things. OK. So this is all the information uh, connected to Pikachu at like two levels. So this starts to be a lot of data. So uh, DGraph's totally fine with that. Chrome, though, not that much. So <laughs> that's a little bit the problem. Uh, cool. So let's do something else. Let's actually use the types and say, in, P in Pokemon, there's genders. So let's see. What are the genders? Uh, I did something weird. Oh, yeah. Uh, there you go. So there's three genders, male, female, and genderless. Cool. So from there, let's find, uh, let's see. So genders, actually, they have a Pokemon species details. That is a list of species that have the, that gender. And then. There's extra information in there, Pokemon species and name. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to expand the whole thing. It's probably a bad idea, but too late. I cannot zoom out enough. There you go. Yeah, that's already full screen. Let's see. OK, so you can see. This is male, that's female. Those are the species that are only female. Those are the species that are only male. These are the species that have two genders. And then these are the species that are genderless. So for instance, uh, what's the name of this one? As elves are genderless. Uh, this is, this one here is, oh, I forgot to put name on the gender. So let's do name two. Uh, you need to give it a minute. I think it will eventually get there. There is actually a lot of data. And I think that this is uh, D3JS. You can see the genderless are already separated. And male and female are separating little by little. 
and the ones in the middle will say bear. Uh, this is gonna take forever because my computer is doing too much stuff right now. But uh, with these, you can already start seeing a lot of things that, you know, if I just give you all the JSON files, finding this out would be very, very hard to do, right? Um, let's find, for instance, uh, you do not, so the question was, how do you specify the node color? Uh, it actually uses just uh, the edges for now. Eventually, we'll use types. But right now, the, the blue ones are the ones that you got from the, from the type gender. Then the ones that are connected to it, which are the species uh, details, are in green. And the species themselves are in pink. But you don't get to choose that. Uh, it's also, you can change it if you want to. Like, you can create your own visualization. At the end, it's just visualizing this really large JSON file. So these all JSONs all there, so you can visualize it. Uh, something that we could do that probably, let me remove that because it's getting annoying. Go away. Okay. Uh, so let's do a little bit different. Instead of getting all of the data, there's a lot of data. Let's just count uh, how many uh, how many species per gender we have. So we can do it, count. So on the graph, we're not gonna be much, but here we can see that there are 684 females, 676 male, and 104 genderless. So with this, you can have a little bit of an idea, but still, the thing is that if you add all of them, it's more than the kind of species we have, because some of them are both male and female. So that's why a little bit. Okay, let's do another one. So this one is gonna be, we're gonna go with all of the Pokemon. We're gonna find all of their types. And for every type, we're gonna get the name. And types are like things like fairy and flying and things like that. So for instance, actually get, let's get the name of the Pokemon too. And the name of the, yeah, that's enough. So gloom is top of that grass, etc. We can render that. Render, 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 more, more, more. And this eventually will create something that is kind of hard to see, but all of the blue ones are Pokemon. All of the pink ones are the types. So you can start seeing them, how they group to each other and all that stuff. But uh, let's say that, you know, what this is showing me is that this is messy data set, right? There's a lot of things going on in there. So let's say that I want to find all of the ones that, you know, they only have one type, right? I want a beautiful graph and the, that beautiful graph, they cannot have too many edges. So I want to get only the Pokemon that are of a single type. So you could do this by doing, uh, wait a second, uh, types, yeah. So we can do filter by count of types is one, and I'm sure I'm missing parentheses. Uh, filter, one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, that was good. So now these are all of the Pokemon that only have one type, so this should render much better. So yeah, these are all of the Pokemon of a single type, so the things in the middle, those uh, pink ones will be the type. So this type water and you have seeking and all that stuff. Uh, so that is, those are filters, right? And you can apply filters in at any level. But here we're filtering at the top level, counting all the types and just getting the ones that have count of types equals one. You could also do gradient then and just get the ones that have a lot of types. Uh, something that'd be interesting is how many of them have two types, for instance. And I trend I'm not gonna, Render that and just gonna get the JSON. And now you're gonna see that all of them, they tell you the two types there are, right? So for instance, gloom is both grass and poison. Cool. The next question is, what if I want to find all of the ones that are both, say, grass and poison? Right? That starts to be a little more complicated. And it actually requires a, another directive that we have. So let's say we're gonna start here. And what I'm gonna do is, uh, so let's set grass. So I'm gonna say, 
This I'm gonna call it grass. I'm gonna filter the types by those that have name grass. Okay, so that should return a bunch of things that have grass. Uh, cool, and some others that do not have grass, right? So grammar is not of type grass. Okay, but we're gonna keep it like that for now. The interesting thing is that you can actually say, you know what? If, the, if anything in there is empty, just remove it. And if something has something empty, remove it too. So basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna be removing the elements that have something empty and we're gonna keep on going up with that. And that is called cascade. If you do that, now you're gonna get only the ones that are of type grass. So you're gonna see only type grass in the center and all of the Pokemon going around. So now if you wanna say grass and poison, you, do this, you, you can do the same thing. So copy, paste, poison, poison. And these are the Pokemon that are of, both, of type grass and poison, right? So you can actually combine things by using Cascade. And you basically like what you would do in SQL with N and stuff like that, you can use it thanks to Cascade. Let's see, uh, what's the line? When I don't sleep enough, I don't write very clearly, so I have no idea what I wrote there. Uh, just the, uh, oh yeah, so if you wanted to get the count, uh, nah, that's not interesting. I think this is probably enough. We saw, we're hiring. Uh, filters cascade, oh, normalize. Uh, so let's say, whoops. Uh, let's say that I wanted to get uh, something similar to this, but I wanna get the, the, te the type name. And right now, so we're gonna just remove all of this, go to the basic one. Okay, so if you run this, you're getting on the JSON, this extra structure that is, this is because of how the data is modeling the graph, right? So you have uh, the name, the Pokemon with the name Gloom has many types. One of them has the, the name Grass. Cool, but I actually do not care about this level. So I wanna break it into like just a list. And that's actually what we call normalize. So if you do normalize, you get nothing. Uh, because what happens when you do normalize is only the ones that you assign a name to specifically are the ones that are going to be kept. Everything else is removed. So you can actually use the same one. So let, actually, let's call it Pokemon name and type name. And now what it's doing is just generating a list of objects for all of the things that match in just one list with a bunch of different objects. So when you're parsing something, probably you want this when you're the client rather than that big graph that you need to recurse inside. So with that, we have uh, normalized, recurse, cascade, and filters. So we've seen all of the ones that I wanted to show you. Uh, reverse edges are actually kind of cool. Uh, so let's say that I want to get, I want to start from Pokemon type, Pokemon type, and I wanna get all of the types of the type in the name. So basically I'm doing the same thing as before, but in the opposite order, right? Instead of starting from Pokemon and getting all the types and then going the, uh, again, you can actually go backwards in the same predicate by doing tilde. Now, if you run that, it will say, oh, it actually, oh, it works, because I actually defined that already. Uh, but uh, basically, the way you're gonna do that is, underscore types, types. Oh no, that should not have worked. I did, oh, but Pokemon type is not a type. What is the name of the type? Uh, Pokemon, oh no, it's type type, okay. Uh, 
uh, exit, exit. Uh, there you go. So it's actually of type type. And then we're going to try to go back. OK. And now it says you cannot go back because the predicate tab doesn't have reverse edge. So that, you know, to fix it, you go here. You find type. Type is here. Click reverse. Click on update. And we're going to also do the same with types. Click reverse. Click on update. Go to the console. Run the query. Sorry, what? I, what? For the reverse heads. Say that again. For the data type, we have to change for the reverse heads. The data type stays, I don't understand the question. Oh, if you, not necessarily. If you, if you were using expand, yes. But if you know exactly what is the predicate that you want to use, you can just use it. Types are optional, right? So. This here, I'm using type only to find the initial values, then I'm, tra I'm traversing by using this. And I think there's something wrong in it, but it's fine, I guess. Um, actually, types, UAD. Okay, so that, that one worked. This one didn't. Because types, it's not called types, it's actually called something else, and I forgot what it is. But uh, that's enough. We can actually do name there. There's no name either. Yes. So these are the types that you have for different types. What is the generation that they appear? So for type fire, physics, psychic, and everything, basically now what we're doing is the same query as before. But instead of starting from the Pokemon and going forward, we're starting from the type and going backwards. And you can do that too. But for that, you need to say that the reverse edge exists, and that will also generate extra things in the, data, in the database, of course. So only use that when you need it. Use the mic, please. Thank you. You are creating bidirectional graph by just. Uh... It is not a bidirectional edge, because uh, I, I would call it bidirectional if you didn't have to use the tilde. Uh, this has a direction. It goes in one way. And by tilde, you're just traversing it backwards. So it's not really bidirectional. It is just that you can, you know, there's a direction, there are directed edges that you can traverse backwards, which is almost the same. It just conceptually is different. And I want to add bidirectional, actual bidirectional edges eventually. So that's why I'm saying no, it is not the same thing. That's a feature request. Cool. So I think that's enough. <laughs> uh, enough Pokemon for today. Uh, so yeah, so if you want to play with this, um, github.com slash shampoo slash pokergraph, I will put the slides online. I'll send them to the organizer so they can share them with all of you. Um, if you want to play with the API itself and find cool things without having to use dgraph, you can also do it, Poke API. Again, we're hiring. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions now, or you want to just go with the next talk? You need to use the mic, otherwise I don't hear you. Yeah, all three are running, only three Docker instance. All, yeah, this is running. Um, so it was here. No, not there, not there, here. Uh, so how it's much running. The, yeah, how much the data size? Dgraph, dgraph, dgraph. So it's three times the same image, but the first one is running alpha, second one is running zero, and the last one is running rattle. And how much the data size for that Pokemon graph? How much? The data size for the actual data size for the Pokemon graph. The data size for the whole thing. That's a good question. I actually didn't look into it. Uh, if you look at the JSON, how do you, is it DF something? Uh, do you know how to check for that in there? I mean, Docker exec, Let, let's connect to the alpha, which is this one. Uh, Docker, Bash, Bash, and the DF Bash IT. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the question is, once I'm in there, how do I look for? Oh. Data? OK, ls. Du dash p. Oh, du dash sh. Oh my gosh, best. It is not as easy as it seems because there's actually a lot of uh, lag in between. I press the key and it appears on the screen. So I'm normally not this bad. Okay, so this is 190 megs. And if you look at the JSON, uh, so the JSON data. Uh, there's probably more than that, but so data API du dash a let's say uh, actually dot uh, in JSON is 383 megs, so it's actually smaller than the JSON. Any other question? Yes, down there. Uh, for questions about the things that I have not talked about, we have the Q&A at the end. Uh, let's keep the question about the things that I've mentioned. Yes. Uh, so uh, if the data size grows to be a, like bigger, like around 50 million nodes or so, uh, how would the performance uh, still go on uh, depend? As its key value stored, uh, that one phase lookups would be fine, but as you go deeper, uh, there would be a lo lot of nodes you'll be looking up and then doing further hops. So how does your performance stays up? So uh, the thing is that you will not be doing farther hops. Okay. That is the important thing, right? Like uh, because of the design, the way it's done, uh, you're not going to be doing hops going out of the servers to get more, more data. You're going to do the minimum, which is a constant, a constant number of hops. It doesn't change depending on the data size. No, but uh, if I have, let's say, uh, friends, of a direct, let, let's say movies of a director, and then some more actors on it. Yeah. And then there, there are. Then you have a key value lookup, key key value store, right? So you have yes. UX zero one. It would hops to x number of uh, uh, directors, and then yeah. movies, and then it would x to y number of uh, actors. There's certainly a hop that's there. How, how do you? There will be a hop if you're actually storing the data in a different group, like if their predicates are stored somewhere else. There will be a hop. But there will be the same number of hops, no matter the size of the data. So, in that case, your uh, data locale, like your uh, all the set of that group, stays in the same uh, store. Not necessarily, but let's say if you have, you're getting like director and then the name, right? So you you have two different predicates, and they were in different machines. You would actually have to talk to different machines, obviously. But if you have one director and one name, or you have one million and one million that's still the same thing. It's still one query. If you would just send in more UIDs asking for more data. So uh, if it's not for predicates, if it's for uh, nodes which are there, uh, this which are properties actually. Maybe I can take that. Yeah, sure, go for it. Um, I, think, I think the underlying question is, if the data size increases, um, would the query slow down, yeah. right? Now, data size could increase in the sense that the database has more data, or your query is asking for more data, right? If the query asks for the same amount of data, even though the database, database is now one terabyte, it should not take any more because you're still touching the same number of uh, keys underlying, right? So it, like, as in, like if a service grows and the number of relation increases and your query size actually would return more data, in that case? If your queries are returning more and more data, they would surely like slightly be um, slightly be slower, right? Because you're just like touching more keys. But uh, key lookups in Badger are pretty efficient. And also the way we do expansions, we do it based on predicates. So the number of network calls that you need to do would remain the same. Um, the payload size would increase, right? And also because everything is integers, it's extremely efficient. Um, so uh, like the, the way it scales is really nicely. Because we have tried using graph databases, and the thing is below second degree lookups, it becomes really slow, and the performance degrades to be used in an online application. Yeah, so um, more, I think, did you use Janus or something? No, we use Neptune. Neptune sucks. Um, so the, the way with Neptune, Janus, and almost all the other 
like graph layers. These are not databases, graph layers. What happens is to do a traversal, you need to first retrieve all the data to the layer, and then the layer does more queries. So the number of network calls that you have to make keeps on increasing proportionally to the size of the result set, right? In dgraph, the biggest thing that we have done is we have kept the number of network calls constant to the number of predicates in the query itself, not the number of result, intermediate or final results. So you sort of pre-process the query and then that's look. There is no query optimization. There's no query planning yet. We will probably add it later, but the, but the way we do it is that we, we would do like, let's say one level of expansion, we get the, the UIDs. And if you need to do another level of expansion, convert it into a UID list and make one network call to the server, which contains the predicate. And internally, it will do a bunch of lookups, et cetera, get a UID matrix back. So a lot of what DGRAP does is going from UID list to UID matrix, right? And finally, you have, let's say you need to find the names. You have a list of UIDs, send it to the name, uh, the server which has a name, single network call again, bigger payload, and then it would do like name lookups internally, return the results, and now you have name. So this is actually pretty crucial. This is exactly what we're doing back at Google as well, is to decrease the number of network calls. You want to decrease the number of machines that you touch to execute a single query. That's the only way to achieve um, really good latency. Any other answers? Thank you. All right. So can we go on here? A few online questions. Someone has a follow-up on no. uh, previous topic. Isn't it difficult to search based on separators? Based on separators? Yes. No. Why would it be difficult? No, I mean, if you have uh, something that allows you to find those separators, so if you have like trigram or something like that, or the separator is separate, it's its own term, you could find it. Okay. There's no special thing for separators. All right. What is the consistency model of alphas? Consistency model of alphas. Yes. Uh, consistency model meaning, I mean, oh, it's, it's strong consistency. So basically, uh, as soon as you write something, uh, it's not alphas, but in general, the database, right? Like as soon as you write something, the next read will return the data that you wrote, right? So it's strong consistency. It's not eventual consistency. Yeah. Cool. I should have mentioned yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, the exact term for that is called uh, linearizable reads which means any read would be immediately available um, once the write is done. Okay, thank you. And is there any way to query other than GraphQL plus minus like an SDK? Uh, so there's an SDK that uses a GraphQL plus minus. <laughs> so like uh, you have Go, we have four official clients, so Go, Python, Java, and JavaScript. There's also three more than official. There is like, ha no Haskell, Elixir, uh, Rust and something else. C sharp, C sharp. Uh, but they also use GraphQL plus minus in internally. And in order to uh, not use that, we have GraphQL coming up soon. But those are for now the ones that you support that we support. Great. So, does GraphQL plus minus support contextual queries like Graph? Contextual queries. I have no idea what a contextual query is. So yes. <laughs> 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 Why not? Yes. <laughs> One more. Let's say I create nodes and predicates like below. Two is less than three. Three is less than four and gone. Can I write a query to return all nodes is less than five? Basically, do predicates follow transitivity property? Uh, so there's two ways of doing this. Uh, if you're actually storing the value of, you know, two, three, four, fives, et cetera, and you create an index, you could actually query all of the nodes that have a value of smaller than five. You can do that. The other way to do it, if you're actually storing as less than, and that is the relationship you're storing, you could also do that with recurse. You would find five and then use recurse to find all of the, point, all of the things that point at that as being less than and recursively. All yeah. right, thank you. Thank you. That's all. Cool, thank you. <laughs>